They were supposed to vanish. After all the invasions, the fires, the famines, the long centuries of silence, no bloodline was supposed to survive that. Not unchanged. Not untouched. But deep inside the cells of modern Greeks, there it is. A genetic fingerprint that shouldn't still exist. A code written over 3,000 years ago, still pulsing through the veins of the living. The Mycenaeans, heroes of bronze, builders of fortresses, the first to speak the language we come to call Greek, were thought to be long gone, lost in the collapse of their world. But when scientists sequenced the DNA of their remains, something staggering emerged. Up to 90% of their genome was still alive. Not in artifacts, not in ruins, but in people, walking the same land, breathing the same salt air, dreaming under the same Aegean sky. Let that sink in. Empires rose and fell. Borders shifted. Languages changed. But the blood, the blood stayed. This isn't just about heritage. It's about defiance. A silent, genetic resistance that endured through war, colonization, occupation. While other peoples were erased or absorbed, the Greeks endured. Not because they conquered, but because they remembered in bone, in breath, in blood. And maybe no one ever told you that. Maybe your history books skipped a part where identity isn't always visible, but it's there, in your cells, waiting to be recognized. So if you've ever felt like part of you belonged to something older, something unshakable, make sure you subscribe. Because we're only just beginning to uncover the stories your DNA still remembers. And the biggest question remains, how did this ancient blood survive everything that history tried to erase? Because something, or someone, kept it alive. They left no monuments, no grand declarations, no written language to explain who they were. And yet, they changed everything. Long before temples rose from stone, before myths were carved into memory, a quiet revolution arrived, not with swords, but with seeds. They came from the east. Anatolian farmers who crossed the Aegean with nothing but livestock, grain, and a way of life the world had never seen. No one remembers their names. But their legacy? It's in the soil, the ruins, and the blood. Because these weren't just settlers. They were architects. Silent architects of the future. As they walked into the valleys of Thessaly and the highlands of Crete, they brought something more than agriculture. They carried the genetic signatures that still beat in Greek hearts today. Haplogroups like J2, G2A, EV13. Ancient codes planted like roots that would grow into the civilizations we call European. Imagine standing in a Cretan field today, and knowing the hands that first tilled this land 9,000 years ago are still alive in your veins. They didn't build empires, but they built the world empires would rise from, with every planted seed, every child born into a stone house instead of a cave. The blueprint of Europe was being written. But here's the part no one talks about. We lost them, or thought we did. History erased their names. Time buried their memories. But science, science brought them back. And now we know they never really disappeared. So the question becomes, when the world began to burn, when the Bronze Age shattered and new blood spilled into old lands, what happened to their legacy? Because their DNA still whispers in the bones of the living. But what happened to the people behind it? Their story doesn't end here. They were a mystery wrapped in stone and sea. No armies, no walls, no warlike gods, and yet they ruled. The Minoans, a people so advanced, so elegant, that even today their ruins feel like a dream we forgot how to build. Palaces without fortresses, art without fear, a civilization without violence at its core. For years, scholars believed they came from somewhere else, Egypt maybe, the Levant perhaps, anything that could explain how such sophistication bloomed so early on a rocky island in the Aegean. But the DNA told a different story. When scientists examined their bones, they found no trace of foreign origin, no evidence of invasion or import. The Minoans weren't outsiders. They were homegrown, descendants of the Neolithic farmers who had tilled the island's soil for thousands of years, their bloodlines local, their roots deep, their legacy born from within. But how? How could people so genetically stable give rise to something so culturally radical? The answer may lie in something few dared to say out loud, isolation. The island of Crete, separated by sea. 
may have protected more than just temples and treasures. It may have preserved genes. Inbreeding, endogamy, not a scandal, but a strategy. A way to keep bloodlines pure. A way to remember who they were, even as the world outside shifted. And yet, the civilization vanished. No great war. No clear cause. Just silence. The frescoes faded. The palaces fell. And the Minoans slipped into meth. But what if they didn't disappear? What if their culture collapsed, but their blood didn't? Because scientists are finding something strange in the DNA of modern islanders. A quiet echo. A familiar code. Could it be? The Minoans are still here? We just stopped calling them by that name. They weren't supposed to mix. The early Greeks, shaped by farmers, born from islands, refined by centuries of silence and soil, were not meant to absorb the blood of warriors from the frozen north. But something happened. Somewhere around 2000 BC, a new thread slipped into the spiral. One that didn't belong to the islands. One that rode with horses, carried fire, and spoke in a tongue the land had never heard before. It wasn't an invasion in the way legends tell it. No scorched earth conquest. No mythic battle to mark its arrival. Just a subtle shift in language, in lineage, in the blood. Because when scientists looked closely at the DNA of the Mycenaeans, they saw something foreign. A signature from the distant Eurasian steppe. Why DNA markers like our 1A and our 1B? The calling cards of nomads who had once thundered across the plains of Eastern Europe. It wasn't dominant. Just enough to leave a mark. Just enough to change everything. And that's where the mystery begins. The Indo-European language family, the most widespread in the modern world, traces back to those same steppe peoples. Their languages reshaped Europe. Their genes rewired whole populations. But in Greece, it was different. The steppe blood came, and then it stopped. It didn't overtake. It didn't erase. It blended. Carefully. Quietly. And somehow, the Mycenaeans didn't just survive that intrusion. They used it. They became the first Greeks. The first to write the language that would echo through Plato, Homer, and every Western classroom. A language born from two worlds the old farming coastlines of the Aegean, and the wild northern plains beyond the Black Sea. But why did it stop there? Why did the Indo-European flood sweep through Central and Northern Europe, reshaping everything in its path, but barely leave a ripple in Greece? Was it resistance? Geography? Or something deeper? Something encoded in the very identity of the land itself? Because if the steppe brought the voice, then who kept the soul? The fires burned for years. Cities crumbled. Scripts vanished. Trade collapsed like a house of sand. From Anatolia to the Aegean, the ancient world tore itself apart, and no one really knows why. They called it the Bronze Age Collapse. And for centuries, the story was simple. The Mycenaeans fell, and new people rose. A dark age. A reset. A blank slate. But then came the DNA. And the story cracked. Because when scientists sequenced the bones buried beneath post-collapse Greece, they didn't find strangers. They found echoes, matches, bloodlines that stretched straight back to the Mycenaean palaces that were supposed to be lost forever. Same markers, same ancestry, same people. The empire died, but the people lived. That changes everything. It means the collapse wasn't a clean break. It was a slow burn. The fall of bureaucracy, of written words, of bronze and gold, but not of memory, not of blood. They didn't vanish. They adapted. They buried the kings. They survived the silence. And they taught their children to do the same. So when the ruins were overtaken by vines, when the stories faded into myth, the DNA carried on, quietly, invisibly, unshaken. But if the Mycenaean blood still flowed, then who were the Dorians? Because history tells us they came next, iron-wielding, war-hardened outsiders who supposedly swept through the ashes. But the genes don't agree. No sudden shift. No foreign fingerprint. Just the same core population evolving. So who really reshaped Greece after the fall? If it wasn't invaders, if it wasn't replacement, then what was it? Something deeper was stirring in the ruins. And what came next wasn't born of conquest. It was born of survival. They came in waves, not armies, but families. The Slavs moved south into the Balkans reshaping the landscape with new languages, new customs, new bloodlines. 
Whole regions changed, borders blurred, and once again, the Greek world stood at a crossroads. But something strange happened. The genes didn't move the way the maps did. In the north, yes, the DNA shifted slightly. A faint new presence. A shadow. But the further south, you looked the fainter that shadow became. By the time you reached the heart of Greece, the islands, the mountains, it was as if time had folded in on itself. The old blood still flowed. The same markers, the same patterns, the same ancient echo of the Mycenaeans and the Neolithic farmers before them. Even under the weight of empires, Byzantine, Arab, Crusader, the genetic thread held tight. It flexed, it bent, but it never snapped. The mountains shielded, the islands whispered, and the people remembered. Not in stories, not in books, but in silence, in marriages within the same valleys, in prayers said in the same dialects, in DNA passed down like a hidden inheritance. The outside world surged and faded, but deep in the folds of the Greek landscape, the code endured. And now, as scientists sample blood from highland villages and forgotten coasts, they're finding things no one expected, pockets of extreme continuity. Genetic signatures nearly untouched by the chaos of history. Villages where the DNA barely changed. Communities where cousins married cousins, not from ignorance, but from tradition, from isolation. But what else did they preserve? Because when genes survive for that long, they carry more than ancestry. They carry secrets, and some of them are still waiting to be decoded. They weren't supposed to be healthy, not by modern standards. They lived in the mountains far from hospitals, surrounded by stone and silence. Their diet? Heavy, rich in fat, the kind of food that should have clogged arteries and shortened lifespans. But they kept living, longer than expected, stronger than predicted, heart disease, almost non-existent. It didn't make sense, until scientists looked deeper. In one tiny highland village in Crete, they found something no one had seen before, a rare gene variant one that lowers cholesterol, protects the heart, and shields the body from the very conditions that kill millions every year. And it wasn't random. This gene, this secret, wasn't gifted by luck. It was built, slowly, over centuries, because these people married their neighbors, their cousins, again and again, generation after generation, not out of ignorance, but isolation. Geography did what war and empire couldn't, it locked them in place, and nature began to experiment. It's called genetic drift, a roll of the dice, over and over, until something rare becomes common, until a protective trait, something that might have vanished anywhere else, becomes woven into the survival code of a single village. And now, this tiny population holds something most of the world doesn't, a key to longer life, to stronger hearts, maybe to medicine's next breakthrough. But here's the question scientists are just starting to ask. If this gene survived in one forgotten mountain town, what else is out there? What other genetic miracles are hiding in the remote corners of Greece? What secrets did endogamy protect? Because the story of human health might not be hiding in labs or hospitals. It might be buried in your grandmother's village. Waiting. She never held a sword. Never sailed to war. Her name was never carved in stone. And yet, She's still here, in your cells, in your breath, in the silent thread passed from mother to daughter, unbroken, for thousands of years. Modern science calls it mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA for short, but what it really is is memory, carried only by women, traced only through mothers, a map not of borders, but of blood. And when researchers followed that thread in Greece, what they found wasn't just ancient, it was eternal. The same maternal lineages, H.T., U.K., and J., that course through Bronze Age women are still here. The same genes that lit oil lamps in Mycenaean homes, that sang lullabies in Neolithic caves, that buried sons, gave birth to daughters, and kept the hearth warm while empires came and went. While the outside world changed, men arrived from the north, bringing new languages and shifting the wide DNA landscape. This thread held. The men moved. The women endured. Because mitochondrial DNA doesn't care about conquest. It travels through the womb. It slips quietly through generations, untouched by the noise of politics, war, or migration. 
So when we talk about ancient Greece surviving, we're not just talking about temples or ruins. We're talking about her, the unknown mother who lived 4,000 years ago, who never saw her name in a book, but whose cells might still be living in someone walking through Athens today. And she's not alone. Across the islands, in the hills of Crete, through the villages of the Peloponnese, her sisters survived too. Not in stories, not in statues, but in mitochondria. So here's the real question. Could your DNA carry the voice of a woman whose name was never written, but whose blood outlived kings? What if your mother's mother's mother remembered something the world forgot? They were supposed to be a memory, a name in a textbook, a footnote from the Bronze Age. The Mycenaeans vanished beneath the weight of history, buried under centuries of collapse, conquest, and forgetting. But they didn't vanish, because when scientists peeled back the layers, bone by bone, gene by gene, they found something almost impossible. The people walking the streets of modern Greece still carry the code of kings. Not a distant echo, not a trace, a living mosaic, the same ancient blend that built palaces in Mycenae that wrote the earliest Greek script, that stood at the edge of legend while the world was still waking up. Inside modern Greeks, that blend remains. Anatolian farmers, who first brought life to the land, eastern genes from the Caucasus and ancient Iran, woven in like whispers from older empires, and just a touch of the steppe, the fierce northern ancestry that came not to erase, but to evolve. It didn't fade. It survived Persian wars, Roman roads, Byzantine rule, Ottoman storms. It withstood languages, flags, and the grinding of history's wheel. And through all of it, the DNA held on. That's not just continuity. That's defiance. It means the Greek genome isn't a relic. It's a time capsule. A biological record of resilience. The blood of warriors, farmers, poets, and mothers, all still flowing together. Uninterrupted. But here's the part that turns science into suspense. If the Mycenaeans survived the fall of their world, who else did? Because if ancient Greece still lives in the genes of the present, what other civilizations, long thought lost, might be hiding in us, too? Waiting to be found. Waiting to speak.